Welcome back, Warriors. Kwe Tanse Sego Anibuju. Kwe Ninda Luizi Pampometer, and I'm the host of this show, The Warrior Life. This podcast is a show about living the warrior life, a lifestyle that focuses on decolonizing our minds, bodies, and spirits, but at the same time, revitalizing our languages, cultures, and traditions. And it's also about asserting, living, and defending our sovereignty all over Turtle Island. And in the last few months, we have been focused on what is happening on the ground on Turtle Island, from Trans Mountain Pipeline on Chequemic Territory, Coastal Gas Link Pipeline in Wet'suwet'en Territory, to violent OPP interventions at 1492 Land Back Lane in Haudenosaunee Territory, and the ongoing violence and terrorism against Mi'kmaq people from non-native fishermen. To say that we are fully engaged on the ground would be an understatement. As Native peoples, we all have a different role to play in defending the rights of our nations, which includes defense on the ground, supplying land defenders with food, providing research for advocacy, representing them with lawyers, raising funds, public education, and you name it, we're engaged at every level. And it doesn't matter what skill you bring, we're always stronger together with our nations when we wrap our arms around those who take the biggest risks on the front lines. And today's guest is one of those people who rallies around her nation every time in whatever way she can and still finds time somehow to support and mentor other Native people, especially women, in similar struggles. Bev Jacobs is a dear friend who I have admired and followed for more years than I can count. She has represented a strong, powerful Native woman who's helped lift up an entire generation of people who have come behind her. Her work has always centered around ending gendered colonial violence and also restoring Indigenous laws and traditions, which is super important. Not only is she an associate prof and associate dean at Windsor University Law School, but she somehow also manages to practice law part-time from her home community of Six Nations. Many of you already know her and will remember her as the former president of the Native Women's Association of Canada, and you would have seen her work at the international level advancing Indigenous human rights. And she's won so many awards, I can't even list them all, but they include the Order of Canada, the Franco-German Prize in Human Rights, Governor General's Award, and many more, specifically for human rights and social justice. Now, Bev is heavily engaged in supporting the Haudenosaunee at 1492 Land Back Lane as the people on the ground try to protect what little land they have left from being developed and ultimately lost forever. I don't know how you even have time to be on this show, Bev, but I'm really thankful that you're here. Welcome to the Warrior Life Podcast. Uh, thank you, Pam. Yeah. Thank, well, thank you so much. And maybe um, you would like to introduce yourself the way you traditionally do and maybe tell us a little bit about the nation that you're from. Okay, sure, yeah. I'd like to... Um, uh, introduce myself in my language first. Skano, Swakwego, Gyaso, Gawankyuse, Gyangihaga, Nyagwai, Shauta, Hotanashoni. So uh, greetings of peace to everyone. I told you my my real name, my Mohawk Bear Clan name, which is uh, Gawankyuse, and it means she's visiting. And um, the Mohawk Nation is part of the bigger uh, Haudenosaunee Confederacy. And um, I, yeah, I live here in my community at Six Nations. Um, been away a few times to go to school in uh, different universities and teach in different places. But um, this is my home. I grew up here and um, was always raised very traditionally in my my community here. My family has always been, uh, I've, I've been ingrained, I guess, in, in the, our traditions um, for as long as I can remember. Being raised with, with our traditional council, with, you know, my, my, my uncles being uh, Confederacy chiefs, and my grandmother was a clan mother, and my aunt is now, and 
being a faith keeper now in the community as well is um, really important to me. That's, that's what grounds me. So that's the most important. So that I was raised with that. And I didn't realize how, how much I was taught or, or even what I was raised with until I went to law school. And then realized, um, you know, how colonial law has really been a tool to try to erase us as a people. So it actually made me a lot stronger, even in, in identifying and relating to my own Haudenosaunee laws. Yeah, I, I'm really glad that you raised that because one, I found the same thing when I went to law school. I found myself thanking myself, oh my goodness, I learned so much from my family. If I hadn't been grounded before I went to law school, I could have been lost in this mythology and ideology and not have known the difference. So like you, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm really thankful. And it's clearly <laughs> you were well grounded before you went to law school with that kind of background in your family. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I'm wondering, you know, there's a lot of people who, you know, look at people from a wide spectrum in terms of all the different Native people doing different things, you know, at all different ages, and they look up to them and the work that they do. And I'm wondering if you wouldn't mind sharing a little bit about your path to where you are today. Like, what was your journey like? And, and you know, what are some of the challenges that people can expect along the way? Yeah, it was, it's been a, a pretty uh, amazing journey, I would say. Um, a lot of lessons learned along the way, which is, uh, I think, part of the biggest uh, part of the journey. <clears throat> but um, I think what uh, what sparked um, what sparked everything really was, uh, you know, my mom died uh, really young in 1989. I think I was only like 20, 24, mm. um, and then. Uh, the Oka crisis happened so in 19 the summer of 1990 and that's that was uh, I was already thinking then actually I was thinking of it in high school um, even way back then about about uh, going to law school um, but I had a baby right after high school my daughter uh, was born like a, right after um, finishing high school. That was like the first thing I want. I wanted to make sure I finished high school before I had any babies. So, um, um, so the, the choice that I made, um, to go into law was, was a result of, uh, my, my mother's death and thinking about life and that life's too short. Um, and that when the uh, the Oka crisis happened, and um, being very angry and thinking, well, what what's my responsibility? It became more about what what should I be doing? And um, yeah, so that's when I decided. And my daughter was was by that time was um, seven years old, and um, so it was a it was a journey from there. And I just it felt like. Um, I ended up in places, um, in different places, different spaces where I would meet leaders, I would meet, you know, different, different Indigenous people, different activists, and I would be really open all the time to learning, to listening, um, to really paying attention to what the issues were, and, um, and then once I got into law school and starting to understand, you know, how those laws had an impact on our people and, and like, I don't know, it was, I don't know, I always think that it's, sometimes it's creator's plan, right, to put you in these places and, and um, um, in leadership places and, and it was just, okay, all right, this, I guess this is what I got to do or someone says, come on, we need you to, we need you to speak up over here. And, um, and it was actually, there was a few mentors that I had, um, uh, like Patricia Montour, um, Sylvia Miracle. Um, they, they were the ones to teach me about um, having a voice because I was really quiet. I was a pretty quiet person. 
uh, before I went to law school and, and I found my voice. And when, once I found my voice, it was like, wow, I, 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 um, I was taught a lot. And, um, and they, they were the ones to help me to, and to remind me about using, using my voice. And that's part of, part of our laws as Haudenosaunee people is, uh, you know, being very good orators, being able to speak and being able to talk about, um, about our laws in, in a really powerful way. <clears throat> so, you know, finishing law school, I, I didn't want to practice law. I thought, how could I be ingrained in a system where it's not helping our people and in fact, it's, it's oppressive. And, um, and that's when I decided to do my master's and, and that's when I focused on the great law, on Haudenosaunee law and, um, and identifying and became right, you know, using my, using my master's, using my education to learn about our, even more about our own law and, um, and international law. And that international, that is our law when we brought together through the great law is bringing our nations together. And, um, and so like, again, it was just being put into those different spaces and places and um and finding my voice and presenting and just became bigger and bigger bigger and bigger <laughs> and then getting involved into politics you know as president of the native women's association of canada and um and it was just you know leading into leading up to that i was a consultant and doing you know work across the country and um, leading into working with Amnesty International on the Stolen Sisters Report and uh, meeting with families across the country who were, you know, in trauma and having to deal with that, that emotional, spiritual, um, the traumas that were happening. So that ended up becoming my, you know, my clients were all dealing with trauma, whether it was uh, families of missing and murdered, whether it was residential school survivors, um, that became um, also, you know, the work I was doing and then using my own experiences to help with healing. Because I too have been, you know, a product of, of violence from a child and then in violent relationships and having to learn um, about what that is on a very personal level. And then also having to, um, you know, my own family member, my own cousin being, being uh, murdered in, in here at Six Nations was, was also very traumatic. And that was, that was right near the end of my term at, at the Native Women's Association of Canada. It was really tough. It was really emotional and, um, and so making a decision that I, it, it was, it became too personal and I was too angry and, um, and had to really focus on healing. So what do I do? I go and do my PhD <laughs> and using that as a, as a way to heal. And I did, it was, I went into hiding for a couple of years to, to work on that. And, um, and the focus was on the, you know, what does holistic health mean to Haudenosaunee people, and specifically in Nakwazasne was my was my um, the community that that I chose the Mohawk community of Nakwazasne, and and um, and so it was a real uh, grounding for me um, to you know meet to meet with our elders and and to ask the questions what makes us healthy and finding out well it is because when we practice our own laws when we practice our own laws, that's what makes us healthy. And then the questions of, okay, well, um, if that makes us healthy, what, you know, what, then what happened to us? What happened to, um, you know, all of the impacts from the focus was on resource development and, um, you know, what happened to, uh, our, our holistic health, but what caused all of the, the disruption, so it was a really, again, you know, that it, it was like that path, I guess, into 
again, back to healing and using our own laws. We have our own traditional healing methods um, and identifying those and our relationship to the water and relationship to the land and, you know, that, that direct connection. And that's where our healthiness comes from, not just, you know, mental, physical, emotional, and spiritual, but also the grounding to our land and water and um, all of creation. So it became a whole, it was an amazing journey. It has been an amazing journey and just everybody that I've met, you know, along, along the way who, um, who led me into that, you know, I learned from them and, and they taught me a lot about, about those responsibilities to others and to other, um, you know, like you said, but those coming, coming behind those, those who are also trying to figure things out. And I've always been really open about what I've, what I've learned and open about um, sharing, sharing that knowledge and, um, and being able to uh, understand um, situations that are beyond our control and, you know, the, the impacts of colonization and genocide and everything that we're having to deal with today. And we're right in, right in the midst of, of coming, you know, coming out of all of that trauma and, and, um, and our people are standing up now. People are, are standing up and demanding, making demands and staying connected and, um, and really focusing on, on the next generations. So I'm really, um, you know, some, some people think, oh, it's such a, such trauma, such, um, you know, to be right in the midst of where we are right now. But it's like, when you think about what our ancestors have, had saved for us and thinking about, you know, the future and that we still have our laws, we still have our language, we still have our, uh, our ceremonies, everything that helps us with our healthiness and, um, you know, to give thanks to them all of the time. And, and those who have been able to maintain it today to be able to, you know, have our ceremonies that we've always had, you know, our language speakers and ceremonial people and um, our faith keepers and our chiefs and our clan mothers to maintain, um, to maintain our laws. It's really powerful. Um, it's a really powerful space to be in today. Yeah, most definitely. And the fact that we still have people, you know, knowing that we still have people doing this means the ancestors are always with us, you know, like they walk with us. They're there when people are, you know, doing their recitals in their ceremonies, when they're doing their practices or when they don't know that, but they're taking the time to learn it or trying to learn their language. Like no matter what stage we're at in decolonization, what really gives me hope is that we're actively engaged in it. We're trying, you know, we, we can't be faulted for being colonized. That's, that's definitely no fault of our own, but all of the beautiful ways in which we're trying to come out of it uh, with the help mm -hmm. of the people who were able to retain it. That's, that's beautiful. That's amazing. And that's really the hope for the future. Yeah, for sure. I see that with what's happening with the young people who are at the 1492 land back lane. Like it's just a really, um, um, it's, and it's not just there. It, it was what happened, you know, in 2006 with Gun and, you know, everybody um, taking that responsibility that, um, that we've always had and, and really um, acting on it really, mm -hmm. you know, taking on those responsibilities and um and i know that that skylar and tawny and all of the uh the others at the land back lane are have really um you know identified the uh and have lived through also Gonestado and knowing you know what what uh what's required and taking those risks and um and just doing it, you know, just, just uh, being there on, on the front lines. And, um, and so it's, it's really powerful. Um, 
you know, in this, this, their generation, especially. Do you think that the Canadian public truly understands the risks that people take when they go on the front line? Because you know, you've got the police boards calling them terrorists and government officials saying they're rogues, you know, always trying to vilify us. So that's nothing new. We've land defenders, water protectors, even just indigenous people in general, we've always been targeted as threats to national security. But do you think Canadians, even allies, truly understand the risks that people take when they take up that responsibility to go on the front lines and risk their personal safety? I think some do. Um, you know, we have lots of allies, lots of, lots of those who are, um, and I think they've been educated. Um, that's where I see the difference are the ones who are educated, who are, have, uh, you know, have learned about the true history, who have learned about our, our relationship to this land and this territory. And, um, but I don't think all Canadians understand. I don't think all people understand because the education system didn't allow them to, to learn about it. And I think that's where the fault, you know, of colonization, of, of even how the education system works and how, you know, the, the true history hasn't been taught in, in the education system. And I think that's where I also see some shifts happening that in some places they are. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, individual teachers that are, are uh, taking the time to to educate about the truth, about treaties, about indigenous people's relationship to, you know, this land and territory and Turtle Island and, um, and being able to uh, teach it in a respectful way. Um, but that's, a, that I would say that's a minority right now. And that, that, that's been um, part of the problem. Um, part of the problem is that, um, you know, how come people don't know who Haudenosaunee people are? How come people don't know about the Haldeman Tract, even those towns and cities that are along the Haldeman Tract? Why, why, don't, why don't people know that history? How come as Haudenosaunee people, we've known that as soon as we're born, you know, about our history and what we've been um, taught about our treaties and treaty rights and relationship with other, other peoples. Um, so I think that, that uh, uh, there's so much systemic racism and even thinking about uh, the media and even how the media portrays, you know, our people and just the whole racist, um, the whole racist dichotomy and how people talk about you know, who we are, that's been ongoing since colonization as well. And, um, and that's, you know, that's taught, the racism is taught from one generation to the next and until they actually um, learn ab about the truth. I think that, that that changes, that changes how people think about our relationship because, you know, racism is violent and it, it causes so much um, violence. Um, and so that to me is, is, um, you know, part of, part of my job now, part of my role is to educate and I'm educating law students. So, you know, I've already seen, um, I've already seen and felt the, uh, the shifts and the changes that are occurring in the law school. And, you know, people are learning about Haudenosaunee law. They're learning about Cree law. They're learning about Anishinaabe law um, from, from those of us who know it, who are raised in it. So it's a, it's a really, um, so far it's been a really uh, um, powerful um, process to see, um, you know, students go through, uh, start out understanding and then, you know, coming out uh, and we'll have that knowledge. So there could be potential judges at some time or politicians. 
So with that background, it, it changes the way that they understand. And, and we actually have um, different courses that we're teaching. And we, we now we have uh, myself and Professor Jill Rogan, who's a criminal law expert. We're both uh, co-teaching uh, an experiential course. So we have five students who have been working on the ground um, with the Land Back Lane group um and the land protectors and really putting things out there in the social media and um you know doing the research and then and some legal research and background to help out some of the uh legal uh research for the team so it was um and it, and it it feels good to know that um you know that they will come out with that understanding that's that would have been different from other generations um, without that knowledge. What I really find so exciting is, you know, you go to the law school and then all of a sudden we've got all of these, you know, teams of law students and they're working on the ground and they're fundraising and they're putting on events and you and I have been in some of those events and it's just massive public education, but for a purpose. You know, it's for a purpose, for action. So not just for information. It's not for entertainment purposes. It's literally, here's what you need to know. Now that you know, let's put this into action. And we're not just preaching it. We're actually doing it. So you have you've are reshaping the role of lawyers, the role of law from you know, this ancient view that they just come to, you know, court in this adversarial situation and everyone represents each other's views and go away, but it's actually action on the ground. It's, it's preemptive, it's holistic, it's, it's being part of the community. Um, it's, it's a wonderful way to look at advocacy and being a lawyer and being a law student and what their responsibilities are as opposed to the, you know, the really old idea about it just being for individuals and, you know, getting a job mm -hmm. or making a living that this is really impacting people's lives in this way. Yeah, for sure. And, and it's, um, you can see when, um, well, actually what right, right from day one, you know, when we first see the, you know, the students coming into, well, before this year, <laughs> seeing students coming into the um, into the law school and and the excitement, um, and uh, and then once they start understanding, because they're not quite sure when they know that they have it's a mandatory course, Indigenous Legal Orders, they're not quite sure what the course is going to be, and then once they start understanding that it it is directly related to indigenous um, people's laws coming from our territories and our land and um, and our, you know, the way that we relate to all of, all of creation. And they see the whole different way of thinking about, about law um, and that it becomes a real uh, grounding for them. So every Friday morning, every Friday morning, they know that they're, you know, they're going to be led by an elder who does a, an opening and grounds them, um, that it's actually very um, different than any other, you know, law course where there's no, there's nothing like that. And then also to, um, you know, to the end of the class and when they, they've learned so much and they, because it's an emotional, our laws are very emotional. And so when, when, you know, they have that emotional grounding as well, they want more. And that by the end, they're saying, is this it? Is this, you know, are we going to have more and upper year courses? And, um, and so we're working on that now. So we're going, we are going to uh, develop very specific courses in, in upper years. So, um, but just seeing, seeing that, you know, as they go through uh, their three years and, um, and just the, uh, the eye opening and the light bulbs going on and, um, and their awareness is, uh, is powerful. And um, I really uh, am happy about, about that about their, um, and not everybody, like mm -hmm. it, it, there's still some real 
you know, some resistance to it and some real, um, you know, what, how can this be, you know, this can't be this way, but because they've been so ingrained in what they've been taught. Um, but I would say overall, um, you know, in the last, so this is going into my fourth year um, at, at Windsor Law and teaching Haudenosaunee Law specifically, um, has been uh, very powerful and very um, um, making those connections with students, especially, um, you know, the development of these experiential courses at, at Windsor Law to be able to, you know, to also to mentor, um, you know, mentor the, the students. All of them are, are women, young women in this course. Um, that that Jill and I are are co-teaching, um, so you can really see the. Um, um, I guess their their understanding of um, of our laws, and then they start questioning. Well, if this is the way it is according to uh, Haudenosaunee law or Indigenous law, then how come this judge over here is is acting the way he is and and saying the things that he's saying because they were directly involved in in um you know in in the the hearing the uh, injunction hearing um and they couldn't believe it they couldn't believe you know what the judge was saying what the judge ordered and you know uh not allowing skylar to um to present his his evidence in the court, and you know they're saying what what precedent what what part of civil procedure does is he following? <laughs> and I say he's not. He's he's not. He's just it's his court. It's his his order. Um, and it's just uh, it's the way that that the realities of the courts and laws and judges have been able to totally. Uh, eliminate, annihilate uh, any voice of Indigenous people. It's so incredible. I mean, they're really lucky to have you because not only are they learning Haudenosaunee law from an actually Haudenosaunee person, but they're also learning about law in the lived actual context and how it rolls out on the ground. And there is literally nothing more eye-opening than educating people about the real history and the real truth and then let them then watch a court with those eyes because then you you they can't help but see it differently even if they're resistant to the teaching once they know then it's yeah. like wow the the injustice the grave injustice is just so obvious it's just sitting right there yeah. it's just about giving people the background information so that they can see it in that way that hasn't been ruined by you know, the national myth and colonization and racist ideologies that's so ingrained they don't even know that it's racism until they are given the tools so that they can actually see it themselves. And um, part of this, I guess, you know, we're talking about, you know, education and and of, of students and us being a part of it and all of this lived education. But there are some elements in our society, and I would say every level of government and government officials who know exactly the history around 1492 Land Back Lane. I mean, the federal government, okay. the provincial government, and the local municipalities all know what the Haldeman Track deed is. They all know that it's not a claim that it belongs to Six Nations. They all know that what they're doing is wrong, but they continue to keep making the exact same decisions. And we know that it stems in large part from racism, but it also stems in part from, you know, this generation of power and wealth uh, at any cost, regardless of whether they have the right to do it. And, you know, given that we know that it's not just about education for public officials, how important is it that people like you and your students and allies like me and other people wrap our arms around Skylar and Micah and all of the people at 1492 Land Back Lane and support them in whatever skills, ways, and talents that we have. That's really important. It's like sending a really positive, like positive energy. Like to me, ener energy is like, 
um, has a huge impact. Um, so when we have all of this like real negative racist energy around us, it's like, it's like when you throw that love over here, you know, throw that, um, that kindness and compassion and, um, it, it makes a huge difference. Like the more prayers that are being sent, the more, like if, if you can't come here and a lot of people aren't able to come, that sending that, that real, real good energy, um, you know, is felt. And, um, you know, that's, that's one way to help our, you know, the prayers, the ceremonies, the, like I said, the love and the kindness is felt. But also, you know, they're starting a winter camp now. Um, so sending all of all of the um, uh, winter gear, anything that can be used in the in the winter time. Um, you know, there's a whole fundraise. There is a fundraising effort. Um, sending, you know, the the funds that that's needed. So there's, I forget, there's what the, the total number is now of, of land defenders who have been criminalized. So they all have to hire um, lawyers. So, you know, uh, both Skylar and Micah and Tawny and uh, Courtney, the ones who are right in the midst of it all, and all of them being charged now, um, you know, and they're, they feel they feel responsible, you know, almost that responsibility for everyone else who have have also taken on that uh, um, that responsibility to protect the land and the territory, and they become pr criminalized. Um, you know, they're they're raising the funds for the the criminal law lawyers, right? And it. People don't realize how much how much they cost. Lawyers do cost a lot of money because of you know the the skills that they have um, and the skills that that are required to help them through that process. And it's a long process. Um, again, you know, a, a whole colonial process of you know um, adversarial um, violent process um so you know with the, with over 30 maybe even up to 40 um 40 uh, land protectors who have been criminalized if they haven't paired up with another lawyer that's 40 lawyers um you know 40 40 legal um legal representation uh, in every because it's individualized as well, right? And every individual goes through the process. Um, that's a, that costs a lot of money, and um, and also now with the civil, uh, the civil side and the the injunction hearing and Skyler being ordered to pay all of the other lawyers' costs, um, which is ridiculous. <laughs> um, you know that's that that would help to address um, all of that. So, um, you know, but the money and the resources and everything to me even, you know, that that's really, really helpful. But I still feel that the positive energy is, is, is also what, what helps, um, what helps us to, to have to deal with this on a daily basis. And, you know, we're here, I'm here in the community and, and there's always worry, right? Because we, we're living in this police state over here where the OPP are all around the whole community. And, and it's like, um, you know, um, I don't want to use this. I don't want to use this kind of um, mentality, but, you know, um, like the wild west mm -hmm. right and and you know the the um you know it it goes right back to the historical you know where there were direct 
military attacks on our people and you know killing our people off right you know with their guns because we didn't have guns and so um you know that to me was part of it's still the same only in a different in a different um scenario um and you know it, it's 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 frustrating and it's worrisome all of the time like this happens all day long you know every day um and thinking that you know maybe that you're being followed um you're being tracked um and those who are on the front lines are being tracked um you know we know that there's all this uh um, you know, drones and pictures being taken and, you know, all of that, um, that how the, however that whole colonial system works, um, and the, um, you know, the racist identification of, um, of us as, as terrorists, as, as criminals, um, it's harsh, like that, that's, that's pretty harsh. Um, and our, and our babies see that, right? Our, our young people see that. And, um, and so it's, it's difficult to, um, you know, have to try to teach them to maintain having a good mind, um, and maintain our own, uh, well-being when all of that's happening on, on the outside and just the, um, the, you know, the instigation that they, that they do. And that's just so, like I said, it's so negative, so violent. And, um, you know, and so we're really pushing for, you know, maintaining that peace and maintaining the, that love and kindness, trying really hard to maintain that. Um, but it gets difficult a lot of times. And that's, you know, that's when that help from the outside helps, when we have that, um, that support. Well, one of the things that has always struck me being from the Mi'kmaq Nation is the way Haudenosaunee peoples, and it doesn't matter which community, whether it's, you know, Six or Akasasana or Ganawage, are always grounded in the mm -hmm. great law of peace and love and peace. Like the ultimate objective is always love and peaceful relations. And you can see that in the land defenders in how they've, you know, they've been there for what, 112 days now, they've engaged in feasts, they've played games of lacrosse, they sit around and tell stories, they have concerts. I mean, that, none of that represents anything other than love and peace and community and tradition. And I think the Canadian public has seen that uh, because we know at the same time, while, I mean, clearly it must be quite a job to try to maintain like positivity when, you're surrounded by the state which has weaponized, has spared no expense to weaponize every tool it has against us simply because we're native. Because we know if this was an issue between two businesses, we wouldn't even be having this conversation. But it's because of us. And I guess right. one of the things I admire about you is that you have been in love and peace and the strength of, of your culture you have been meeting the state in every forum. So you're, you know, you're grounded in your traditions and that's a form of resistance. You're mentoring other people to come up behind you and inspiring people like me, which is another form of resistance and empowering others. You're confronting them here in Canada's courts, but you're all, you've also been at the United Nations and around the world. You're, you literally don't give Canada a break. You're just like, okay, you're going to create another <laughs> Form and another tool and you're going to weaponize something else well i will meet you in every place and that is inspiring despite the challenges and the difficulties and the unfairness that it is to us i am so thankful for people like you bev that shows that we don't have to just pick one forum we can literally meet them on every forum and challenge them until we are ultimately successful and we do have wins along the way and i think just the fact that 1492 land back lane people have been there for 112 days that like every day is literally a victory and a celebration it's a reoccupation and a reconnection with the land and 
you know, I, I can't thank you enough for what you do, Bev, um, for all of us. And I think that's representative of the Haudenosaunee people because one of the things I told Skylar, it's like in the middle of the OPP committing acts of violence, Skylar still finds time to, to post on social media and make statements about standing in solidarity with the Mi'kmaq on the East Coast or the Wet'suwet'en. Like we still find time to hold each other up even when we're under attack. And I think that's one of the things I love about our people, but I love about you because I know you will always be there for everybody else. And, and I really appreciate that. Thanks, Pam. I know that um, I, really, I really believe in, in uh, the strength of, of our ancestors. And I know that, that um, they're always with me. And like, no matter what I do, no matter where I go and, and, and I hear them, I hear them all the time. And they're, you know, they're telling me to, you know, say this, you know, don't be afraid to tell Carolyn Bennett off, like tell her, <laughs> tell her because you invited her here. You, you make her responsible for, for, you know, making those connections here in the community and, you know, and, and doing that in, in all different places and spaces because that I carry that with me wherever I go. That's what I've been taught. I've been taught that we're all equal, that we're all the same, that we're no matter where we go, no matter where I go, it's, um, you know, the same, I say the same thing everywhere that I go, the same message. And, um, and I still, you know, feel the strength of, of uh, my ancestors with me all of the time everywhere and we're so thankful because when they walk with you you're walking with us and that means they're walking with us and i think all of our san yeah. ancestors are as united as we are now you know it's like although we're separate sovereign nations we've all come together with the same common foe and and it's it's just really beautiful to see how we all come together and i really you know yeah, thank you Thank you for taking the time to share your personal journey because it is very personal, um, but it inspires mm -hmm. other people and for the work you're doing to help people at 1492. So, Nyawan, and thank you to thank you. all of the listeners as well for listening, but not just listening, for, for learning, for sharing these podcasts and videos, for sharing the information. Um, I'll make sure also to post all of the links um, about 1492 Landback Lane, the list of supplies they need, um, how you can contribute to fundraising and other things, other ways you can support by sharing documents and in the media and, and uh, in every way you can support and the positive energy. And we will keep uh, track of what's happening at 1492. We will keep working in solidarity. And thank you everyone for tuning in to the Warrior Life podcast. Till next time, keep living a warrior life. Walaliag.